today we're going to do the basic forms chart. This is the first class that I like to teach. It teaches a lot of shading, understanding light on form, and how to use tools. For this project, you're going to need your this other Bristol board. This is watercolor paper. Either will do some kind of a plastic container with a lid, like a to-go container. We use these as our palettes. And then put the lid back on and the paint keeps indefinitely. You need a couple brushes. Mainly we'll be using the quarter inch brush. Also need a squirt bottle, a glass of water for paint, and back in the early days of the Renaissance, the people put their minds together and they decided that everything in the world could be broken into four basic forms. And they said if you could understand how to shade those four forms, you could shade anything. So what they're talking about is that what happens when the light hits the object. Light on form. This is also called chiaroscuro in Italian. We often use that terminology. Get out a piece of white paper and a pencil, please. And we're going to draw in the four basic forms. And I like you to draw very light and loose. And that way you can erase the lines that you don't like. We can write at the top basic forms. First we're going to draw the sphere and I just want you to go with your lightest touch round and round and round maybe ten times. Some of those lines will be the lines that you want and some won't. Then step back, look at what lines make a nice circle and darken those lines in. If you like you can erase the other lines. We're going to put a cone Next, we will have a cylinder. So I'd like you all to draw an oval, round and round, darkening in the parts that you like, lines down from the edges, and again, it has a rounded bottom, which is almost the same curve as the top for this picture. You can see that in a cylinder here. If you See the top open. See the bottom is rounded because it's a round object. And last we're going to do a cube. So I'd like you to do a smaller square and then over and down and a little bit bigger because it's farther towards the viewer. Another square. Now connect the edges. And we can erase the lines that we don't need, which would be the inside lines on that box or cube. We also can put in the shadows, the cast shadows. And these are going to fall away from the object in the shape of the object on the cone, the cylinder the same. And on our box, the shadow is going to go off to the side. We can always ask ourselves when we're starting a realistic painting, where is the light coming from? So in this picture, we're going to have our light here. Now often when you're starting a piece of art, you might be in a room or a place where there's multiple light sources. And you have light coming from every direction on your still life object. This does not give you the pretty studio lighting that artists often like to use. So by doing this chart, you can create your own shading with a single light source. Another time you might go outside landscape painting and it'll be a cloudy day and you won't have nice light and shadow. But you can always add in your own shading by using this chart. So keep this chart in your bag. Pull it out when you're doing any sort of realistic imagery. So we're talking about a single light source and I'm going to set up my palette. Very, very important to take time with your palette. Artists don't just grab tubes and then just take it straight from the tube to the painting. There's a lot of mixing involved. Using my quarter inch brush, I'm going to 
set up dark, medium, and light. So for the dark, I'm just going to use the straight black. So that's already set. And I'm going to take a scoop from the black and scoop some of the white and blend them together. Now we want good size puddles of these. I've got about two teaspoons of the black and maybe three teaspoons of the white squeezed out. So I want to make enough to do our whole picture. I don't want to have to stop and keep remixing these colors. So I'm setting up the palette for the entire piece. When you're working with light on form, you pretty much always want to get dark, medium, and light together. Then I'm going to use what's on my brush and a little bit of the black. Not too much. And I'm going to mix the light gray. And I want this nice and light. We want the difference between the dark, medium, and light. We want to really be able to see the difference. I think that's pretty good. When you wash your brush, shovel it around in the water, take it in your rag, and pull between your fingers. Traditionally, artists work dark to light. I'm going to start with the sphere. I'm going to scoop up a good amount of color and I'm going to put on that darkest color. And that's the core of darkness and it's away from the light. And I'm putting it on in a crescent moon shape and I'm not going all the way to the outer edge. That's important to remember. I'm going to take a moment and squirt the palette. Must continually do that scoop up some medium. So we want actually a layer of paint on the surface, almost like frosting a cake. So you're laying on an actual layer of paint that you can move around and push around. That's the medium there. I'm going to get a clean, damp brush. You can get an additional brush or you could use the same brush. And that's what you use to blend with, what we call an empty brush. It's just been dipped in the water. And see, I have these two values. I have the dark and the medium. And I'm going to rub together in a perpendicular stroke to the strokes that are already there. We definitely don't want all the strokes going in the same direction. And I'm feathering these together. And you notice I have to keep wiping my paintbrush. If I don't wipe the paintbrush, I'll be applying the paint. I'll be laying on the paint rather than blending it. So in order to use the brush as a blending tool, you must continually keep it empty, keep it free from paint. And going this way and that way with the brush strokes. Definitely don't want stripes and definitely don't want all the brush strokes going the same direction. Now I'm going to scoop up some of the light color and lay that in on the remaining part. A little bit too much. You want it too thick. So some of the things you get used to is how thick you want it, what's too thick, what's too thin. We don't want any of the paper to show through. We want to put a nice thick layer. And there I've laid it in. Now I need to get that clean damp brush. I'm just using the same brush, but you could use an additional brush. And I'm going to feather the medium into the light. And that's by rubbing right where the values meet. When painting, we call light to dark, we call value. We have our dark and our medium and our light. Nice and smooth graduation one to the other. And when you have enough paint on your paper or your canvas, you can move it around a little bit. It becomes almost like a sculptural type of feeling. Okay, now there's a very important element called reflected light. And that's the light that comes down, hits the table over here, or whatever objects are around, bounces off and comes up and hits the back side of the object. Light is made of something called photons. Photons are tiny particles. They're always moving, bouncing, and vibrating. The speed that the photons vibrate is the color that we see. 
So we are very aware as artists that light is moving and we're trying to capture that reality in our painting. For the reflected light, the light that's bouncing off, I'm going to use a medium value. And although most people don't realize that this reflected light exists, it's something that artists recognize. And when you do put the reflected light into your picture, it tends to look more three-dimensional. Now there's a good chance that your dark has dried by now. That happens with the acrylics. I'm going to re-wet some of those darks over there. And that way I'll be able to blend that reflected light into the dark. Sometimes it's nice to reinforce the darks a little bit anyways. And I'm going to blend that in. The more contrast, the more dynamics. You want your darks to be all the way dark and your lights to be all the way light. And that's what gives three dimensions. That's what gives realism. That's what gives dynamics. So even in an abstract piece of art, you will want dynamics between light and dark. Okay, so here we have our light, medium, dark, and reflected light. It's a very soft glow on the back side of the object. And if you look closely, you will see it. Now there's something called a highlight. And that's where the light hits the object and it's hot, white light. And in this, for this, I'm going to use the white straight out of the tube. I'm going to put it on pretty thick. And I'm going to put it on in a curved shape because this is a curved object. If we went over the surface of the object, I'd be going in a circular way. So I want to feel that and put that highlight on that curved object. A shiny material, a metal or a shiny apple would have a very crisp highlight with crisp edges. And a piece of fabric or something will have a more muted, soft highlight. Now let's look at the cast shadow. It's called cast, like when we fish, we throw. So it's a shadow that's thrown away from the object. And it's darkest near the object. I'm going to take my striped black and bring it right around the edge there. That nice black. And you'll see that the reflected light serves another purpose here in that it allows you to see the object separate from the cast shadow. And as the shadow goes away from the object, it fades because it becomes mixed in with the atmospheric light in the room. So it's darkest near the object, and then I have it going into a gray. Let's clean the brush and move on to the cone. Squirt my palette. About every five minutes it has to be squirted or else all this will just go to waste. So I'm going to make this skinnier at the top and fatter at the bottom because that's the shape of the object. Follow the form. Again, not go all the way to the edge. Scoop up the medium, medium in the middle. Have one color go right into the other one. They should be touching. We don't want stripes. What we're doing here is shading. So we get the damp, empty brush and feather. Feather, one, two, three, white. To be able to have a color or a value gradually fade from one thing into the other is the faculty that you want to have when you're painting. Wash off your brush, scoop up the light, and lay in that light. Let the edges be messy. Clean the brush off. Or you could use two brushes either way. And feather. And you must work quickly with acrylic paints. You only have like a five minute dry time. So you really need to get in there and start blending and shading very quickly. You don't have time to he be hesitant. Just go in there and start pushing it around. Don't want any of the paper to show through. If it's a little thin, when the paper is showing through, like I had there, just add some more paint. There we go. 
Then on the back of it, we have our reflected light. For that, I'm going to use the medium value. And put that right along that back edge. And I'm going to put a little bit on the bottom edge. When we're doing art, we don't want to be copying things. We want to take these principles of science and apply them while we're also observing the world around us. And then we apply these principles that we know. And this is a type of science, understanding light, the movement of light. I'm going to put the highlight on the cone. So I use the white paint straight out of the tube. And it's going to run down that edge where the light is hitting it directly. We're showing our heightened sense of observation. So the core of darkness is away from the light. It's sort of a messy edge. I don't want a straight edge because I might end up with a stripe. Laying in the core of darkness. Not all the way to the edge. Scoop up the gray, the middle color, and put it right in the middle. So medium in the middle, like cake crust. Nice and thick. And feather. Rub these together. If the strokes are going one way, then go the opposite way. Go crisscross. Go all different ways. We don't want the strokes to be all the same direction. I'm going to push them around one way, and then I'm going to push them around another way. I'm going to keep moving that paint. If I lose some of the dark, like I did right there, it's easy enough to take more dark and put it back in. This is how oil paints I use, with this sort of blending. And that gives a very rich, rich look. Okay, and I'm going to go to the light. Lay in the light color and let it touch right into the other one. You don't want any paper left. When you work in other techniques, you might want some of the paper exposed. When you use acrylics as watercolors in a watercolor way, you do leave the paper exposed. But right now, we're using the acrylics a bit more like oil paint. And acrylics are very versatile. And you can use them in a lot of different ways. It's okay to leave some of those brush strokes. Brush strokes are desirable. It doesn't have to be super smooth. Now I'm going to do the reflected light and just lay in that line on the outer edge. How do we handle the inside of the cylinder? That's an interesting topic. And what we're learning to do is follow the light on the cylinder. You can see the light is coming from this side, so we have the light, medium, dark, the reflected light, and then you see there's the inner opening, and the light is coming and it's hitting this side, and this side is dark, so the opposite shading goes on on the inside, and when done correctly, it creates the illusion of an opening. So I'm going to take my smaller brush for this. I'm going to take the darkest value and put it on this side. The medium, of course, will go in the middle, as you know by now. Medium in the middle. And when you're actually working from a still life, this is something you can study and look closely at and see exactly how the light and shadow fall inside of the object. Then on this side, we'll have the lightest value. We have the dark, medium, and light. And it gives the illusion of an opening. Let's put in the highlights. And that'll be the straight light. 
and that'll go over on this side. And it'll go over there. Right with the light is hitting it like this, hitting there and hitting over here. Because it's a straight edge, I'm going to put a straight highlight. Now let's go to the last shape, the cube. Now this is going to react differently to the light because it has these straight edges. So instead of the light slowly wrapping around in a smooth way, the, the light is going to be stopped on these crisp edges. So it'll have a different value on each side of the box. Let's see how that would work. We're going to have the light coming from the same direction again. So the top will be our light value. Not too much, not too little. And you notice with this type of painting, the shading, we're not using any water mixed with our paint. Other techniques, you do use water. But with this, we don't really want any water. We want a damp brush, but we don't want to put water into the palette at any point. Always hit your rag before you go to the palette. Don't ever go right from the water to the palette when you're doing this technique. I'm going to make this the dark over here because it's away from the light. And then this will, of course, be the medium because it's on the light, it's on the dark. I'm going to make this the medium. And I'm going to fill in the whole front of the box. Now you see I still have my palette. I haven't stopped to remix. If you do have to stop and remix, it's fine. It's good practice in mixing. I'm not happy with the way this shadow is running into that. So that's something that we learn to tweak when we're doing the art. We look at how the objects touch and what happens when they touch. And I'm going to make the shadow a little darker so that it doesn't blend in too much with the cube. Now you can see where that cube starts. I'm going to put a, a medium along that bottom edge as a reflected light. So that when I do put in the cast shadow, you'll be able to see it. Let's take a look. It's dark. Put it right in there. Probably when you're working on a landscape still life will what be it. It's not going to be perfect lighting. You want to manipulate it to work for your picture. Okay, let's put the highlights in this cube. You'll see the light is hitting right there. Put a couple of highlights right on that top. Okay, take your palette and squirt it with the squirt bottle. Every time you're about to close it, squirt it first. And then that moisture is going to stay in there. And when you open it next time, those paints are going to be just like fresh out of the tube. Let's label one of these so that you can remember them in the future. Okay, take out your pencil and let's label this sphere. First, we did the the darkest part, we'll just call that dark. Then we did the medium in the middle. So we'll make a diagram here. We'll write medium. And then we did the light. So let's draw a line and write light. And there's other elements also that we discovered. There's the reflected light that bounces off the table or other objects. And if it's a color, it will bounce off with that color. If the tablecloth was green, the reflected light would be green. So it's a very cool element. Reflect.
reflected light. Okay, this here, the straight, bright white light is called a highlight. That's right where the light is hitting the object. And back here, the shadow that goes away, that's thrown, is called the cast shadow. And if you can use those elements, you'll always get a very nice three-dimensional image. Thank you.